are you? Nice to meet you. Very nice to meet you. Yeah, Looks like you cleared out my whole office. Yeah, we got rid of it. Man, I mean, I think it's here. I hope they're going somewhere, somewhere. How you been? I'm doing all right, man. How are you? I'm doing great. I should have told you, by the way, you didn't have to wear a tie, but you look sharp. You know more about this stuff than I do, so. Uh, well, that's terrible. <laughs> President Barack Obama, you're the 44th president of the United States. We're here at the Obama Foundation. Welcome to Decoder. It is great to be here. Thank you for having me. I am really excited to talk to you. There's a lot to talk about. We are here on the occasion of President Biden signing executive order about AI. I would describe this order as sweeping. I think it's over 100 pages long. There's a lot of ideas in it. Everything from regulating biosynthesis with AI. There's some safety regulations in there. It mandates something called red teaming, transparency, watermarking. These feel like new challenges, like very new challenges for the government's relationship with technology. I wanna start with a decoder question. What is your framework for thinking about these challenges and how you evaluate them? This is something that I've been interested in for a while. So uh, back in 2015, 2016, uh, as we were watching the landscape transformed by social media and the information revolution impacting every aspect of our lives, uh, I started getting in conversations about artificial intelligence and this next phase, this next wave that might be coming. And uh, I think one of the lessons that we got from the, the transformation of our media landscape was that incredible innovation, incredible promise, incredible good can come out of it, but there are a bunch of unintended consequences and that we have to be maybe a little more intentional about uh, how our democracies interact with what is primarily primarily being generated out of the private sector, and and uh, you know, what rules of the road are we setting up, and, and and how can we make sure that we maximize the good and maybe minimize some of the bad? And so I commissioned the you know my science guy John Holdren uh, along with John Podesta who had been a former chief of staff and. Uh, worked on climate change issues. Let's pull together some experts to figure this out. And we issued a, a big uh, report in my last uh, year. The interesting thing even then was uh, people felt enormously promising technology, but you know we may be overhyping how quick it's going to come. And as we've seen just in the last year or two, even those who are developing these large language models uh, who are, you know, in the weeds uh, with these programs are starting to realize this thing is moving faster and is potentially even more powerful than we originally imagined. Now, so my framework and in conversations with government officials, private sector, academics, the, the framework I emerge from is that this is going to be a transformative technology. It's already in all kinds of small ways, uh, but very broadly changing the shape of our uh, economy in some ways, even our search engines, you know, basic stuff that we take for granted is already operating under some AI principles, but this is gonna be turbocharged. It's gonna impact how we make stuff, how we deliver services, how we get information, and the potential for us to have enormous medical breakthroughs, the potential for us to be able to provide individualized tutoring for kids in remote areas, the potential for us to solve some of our energy challenges and, and deal with greenhouse gases, that, that this could unlock amazing innovation, but that it can also do some harm. Yeah, we can end up with powerful AI models in the hands of somebody in a basement who develops a new smallpox variant, uh, or uh, you know, non-state actors who suddenly, because of a powerful AI tool, can hack into critical infrastructure, uh, or maybe less dramatically, uh, AI, you know, infiltrating the lives of our children in ways that we didn't intend. In, in some cases, the way social media has. So what that means then is, is that I think the government, as an expression of our democracy, needs to be aware of what's going on. The, those who are developing these frontier systems need to be transparent. I 
don't believe that we should uh, try to put the genie back in the bottle and and be anti-tech because of all the enormous potential. Uh, but I think we should put some guardrails around some risks that we can anticipate and have so, enough flexibility that it doesn't uh, destroy innovation, but also is guiding and steering uh, this technology in a way that uh, maximizes uh, not just uh, individual company profits, but also the public good. So let me make the comparison for you. I would say that the problem in tech regulation for the past 15 years right. has been social media. How do we regulate social media? How do we get more good stuff, less bad stuff, make sure right. the really bad stuff is illegal? You came to the presidency on the back of social media. In a, I was the first digital president. You had a BlackBerry, I remember. People were very excited about your BlackBerry. <laughs> I wrote a story about your iPad. That was transformative. That's young yeah. people are going to take yeah. to the political environment. They're going to use these tools. We're going to change America with it. You can make an argument. I wouldn't have been elected had it not been for social networks. Now we're on the other side of that. There yeah. was another guy who got elected on the back of social yeah. networks. There was another movement in America that has been right. very negative on the back of that election. Right. We have basically failed to regulate social networks, I'd say. There's no comprehensive privacy bill even. Right. There was already a framework for regulating media in this country. Mm -hmm. We could apply a lot of what we knew about right. should we have good media to social networks. Right. There are some First Amendment questions in there, right. what have you, the important ones, but there was an existing framework. Right. With AI, it's we're going to tell computers to do stuff, and they're going to go do it. Right. We hope. That we have no framework for that. <laughs> we, we hope they do what we, we, we hope, right? think we're telling them to do. We also ask computers a question, and they might just confidently lie to us or help us yes. lie at its fail. Right. There is no framework for right. that. What do you think you can pull from the sort of failure to regulate social media into this new environment so, such that we get it right this time? Or well, this is do anything at all? Well, this is part of the reason why uh, I think uh, what the Biden administration did today in putting out the EO, the work they've done is so important. Not because it's the end point, but because it's really the beginning of building out a framework. And when you mentioned how this executive order um, has a bunch of different stuff in it. Uh, what that reflects is we don't know all the problems that are going to arise out of this. We don't know all the uh, you know, promising potential of uh, AI, but we're starting to put together sort of the foundations for what we hope will be a smart framework for dealing with it. And in some cases, what AI is going to do is to accelerate advances in, let's say, medicine. Um, you know, we've already seen, for example, uh, with you know things like protein folding and, and the breakthroughs that can take place that would not have happened had it not been for some of these AI tools, and. You know, we want to make sure that that's done safely. We want to make sure that it's, um, you know, done responsibly. And it may be that we already have some laws in place that can manage that. There may be some novel uh, developments in AI where an existing agency, an existing law just doesn't work. Uh, you know, we, if we're dealing with the alignment problem and we want to make sure that some of these large language models um, where even the developers aren't entirely confident about what uh, these these models are doing, what the computer's thinking or doing. Um, well, in that case, we're going to have to figure out what are the red teaming, what are the testing regiments. And in talking to the companies themselves, they will acknowledge that uh, their safety protocols and their testing regiments, et cetera, may not be where they need to be yet. Uh, and I think it's entirely appropriate then for us to plant a flag and say, all right, frontier companies, you need to disclose what your safety protocols are to make sure that we don't have rogue programs going off and uh, hacking into uh, in our financial system, for example. Um, tell us what tests you're using. Make sure that we have some independent verification that right now this stuff is working. Um, but that framework can't be a fixed framework because these 
models are developing so quickly that you know, oversight and any regulatory framework is going to have to be flexible and it's going to have to be nimble and it's going to and by the way it's also going to require some really smart people who understand how these programs and these models are working not just in the companies themselves but also in yeah. the nonprofit sector and in government which is why i was glad to see that the biden administration part of the executive order is specifically calling on a bunch of you know hotshot young people who are interested in ai to do a stint outside of the companies themselves and uh, you know, go work for government for a while. Go work, you know, uh, with some of the research institutes that are popping up at, in places like uh, the Harvard Lab or uh, the Stanford AI Center um, and some other nonprofits. Because we're, we're going to need to make sure that um, everybody can have confidence that whatever journey we're on here with AI that it's not just being driven by a few people yeah. without any kind of uh, interaction or voice from um, ordinary folks, regular people who are going to well, be well, using these products there. and impacted by these products. There's ordinary folks and there's the people who are building it who need to go help write regulations. Right. And there's a split there. The conventional wisdom in the Valley for years is the government is too slow. It doesn't <laughs> understand technology. Yeah. And by the time it actually writes a functional rule, the technology was aiming to regulate yeah. will be obsolete. This is markedly different, yeah. right? The AI doomers are the ones asking for regulation the most. Yeah. The big companies have asked for regulation. Yeah. Sam Altman has toured the capitals of the world, right. politely asking to be regulated. Why do you think there's such a, a fervor for that regulation? Is it just incumbents wanting to cement their position? Well, I, look, I, I, you're, you're raising an important point which is, and, and rightly, there's some suspicion, I think, uh, uh, among some people that, yeah, these companies want regulation because they want to lock out competition. And uh, as you know, historically, sort of a central principle of, of tech culture has been open source. We want everything out there. Everybody's you know, uh, able to, to play with models and applications and and uh, create new products uh, and that's how innovation happens here regulation starts looking like well maybe we start having closed systems and you know the the big frontier companies the microsoft's the google's the open ai's anthropics that they're going to somehow lock us out um but in have in, in my conversations with the the tech leaders on this I think there is, for the first time, some genuine humility because they are seeing the power that these models may have. I, I, I talked to one executive, and, and look, there's no shortage of uh, hyperbole in, in, in the tech world, right? But this is a pretty sober guy, uh, like an adult who's <laughs> now who's, I have to guess who who's, it is. Who's, who's seen a bunch of these cycles and been through boom and bust and. And I asked him, I said, well, when you say this technology you think is going to be transformative, give, give me sort of some analogy. He said, you know, I sat with my team and we talked about it. And after going around and around, what we decided was maybe the best analogy was electricity. And I thought, well, yeah, electricity, that was a pretty big deal. Yeah. <laughs> and if that's the case, I think what they recognize is that it's in their own commercial self-interest that there's not some big screw up on this. That if in fact it is as transformative as they expect it to be, then having some rules, some protections that create a competitive field, allow everybody to participate, come up with new products, compete on price, compete on uh, functionality, but you know that none of us are taking such big risks Yeah, there's that, a view that in the, the whole thing blows up in our faces, I do think that the, that there is sincere concern that if we just have an unfettered race to the bottom, that this could end up um, you know, choking off the goose that might be yeah. laying a bunch of golden eggs. There is the view in the Valley, though, that any constraint on technology is bad. Yeah, that and any, I disagree Any with caution, that. any principle where you might slow down 
is the enemy of progress, and the net good is better if we just race that as fast as possible. In, in fairness, that's not just in the Valley. That's in every business I know. <laughs> it's not like Wall Street loves regulation. It's not as if manufacturers are really keen for government to micromanage how they produce goods. Um, but one of the things that we've learned, you know, through the industrial age and and the information age, you know, over the last century is that you can overregulate, you can have over bureaucratized things, uh, but that if you have smart regulations that set some basic goals and standards, making sure you're not creating products that are unsafe to consumers, making sure that if you're, you know, selling food, you know, People who go in the grocery store can trust that they're not going to die from salmonella or E. coli. Making sure that if somebody buys a car, that you know the brakes work. Uh, making sure that uh, you know if if I take my electric whatever and I plug it into a socket anywhere, any place in the country, that it's not going to shock me and blow up on my face. It turns out all those various rules, standards, actually create marketplaces and are good for business. And innovation then develops around those rules. So it, it, it's not an argument that, I, I think part of what happens in the tech community is the sense that we're smarter than everybody else. And these people slowing us down are impeding uh, rapid progress. And I, you know, when you look at the history of innovation, it turns out that having some smart guide posts around which innovation takes place, um, not only doesn't slow things down in some cases, it actually raises standards and accelerates progress. There were a bunch of folks who said, look, you know, you're going to kill, uh, the automobile if you put airbags in there. Well, it turns out actually people figured out, you know what, we can actually put airbags in there and make them safer. And over time, the costs go down. There's a great and TikTok everybody's of better off. somebody reacting to drunk driving laws in the 80s. It's great. I'll send it to you. Um, there's a really difficult part in this EO about provenance. Yeah. Uh, watermarking content, right. making sure you, people can see it's AI generated. You are among the most deep faked. Oh, absolutely. People in the world. Well, because I, what I realized when I when I left office, I'd probably been filmed and recorded more than any human in history, just because I happened to be the first president when the smartphone <laughs> <laughs> came out. I'm assuming you have some very deep personal feelings about being deep faked <laughs> in this way. There's a big First Amendment issue here, right? I can use Photoshop one way mm -hmm. and the government doesn't say I have to put a label on it. Right. I use it a slightly different way. The government's going to show up and tell Adobe, you've got to put a label on this. Right. How do you square that circle? Well, it I, seems look, very challenging I, I, to me. I, I think this is going to be an iterative process. I, I, I don't think you're going to be able to create a blanket rule. But the truth is that's been how... Um, our governance of information, media, speech. That's how it's developed for a couple hundred years now. With each new technology, we have to adapt and figure out some new rules of, of the road. Um, so let's take my example. A, a deep fake of me um, that is used for political satire or just to, you know, somebody doesn't like me and they want to deep fake me. I was the president of the United States. And there are some pretty formidable rules that have been set up to protect people from making fun of public figures. I'm a public figure. And what you are doing to me as a public figure is different than what you do to a 13-year-old girl in, in you know, high school, freshman in high school. And so we're going to treat that differently. And that's okay. We should have different rules for public figures than we do for private citizens. We should have different rules for um, what is uh, clearly sort of political commentary and satire versus cyberbullying or... Where do you think those rules land? Do they land on individuals? Do they land on the people making the tools like Adobe or Google? Do they land on the distribution networks like Facebook? My suspicion is how responsibility is allocated. We're going to have to sort out. I think that 
but but I think the the key thing to understand is and, and, and look, I, I taught constitutional law. I'm close to a First Amendment absolutist in the sense that I generally don't believe that um, you know, even offensive speech, mean speech, et cetera, it should be certainly not regulated by the government. And I'm even game to argue that on social media platforms, et cetera, that the default position should be pe free speech rather than censorship. I agree with all that. But keep in mind, we've never had completely free speech, right? We have laws against child pornography. We have laws against, uh, you know, uh, human trafficking. We have laws against um, s certain kinds of speech that we deem to be really harmful to the public health and welfare. And the courts, when they evaluate that, they say, mm, you know, they, they come up with a whole bunch of mm -hmm. time, place, manner restrictions that may be acceptable in some cases, aren't acceptable in others. You get a bunch of case law that develops. There's arguments about it in the public square. We may disagree. Should Nazis be able to protest in Skokie? Well, you know, that's a tough one. But, you know, we can figure this out. And, and that, I think, is how this is going to develop. I do believe that the platforms themselves are more than just common carriers like the phone company. They're not passive. There's always some content moderation taking place. And, and so, you know, the, once that line has been crossed, it's perfectly reasonable for the broader society to say, well, we don't want to just leave that entirely to a private company. I think we need to at least know how you're making those decisions, what things you might be amplifying through your algorithm and what things you aren't. And, you know, it, it may be that, that what you're doing isn't illegal, but we should at least be able to know how some of these decisions are made. I think it's going to be that kind of process that takes place. What I, what I don't agree with is the large tech, tech platform suggesting somehow that um, we want to be treated entirely as uh, a common carrier and it's the Clarence Thomas view, right? Yeah, which which but on the other hand, we know you're selling advertising based on the idea that you're making a bunch of decisions about your well, products. Well, this is very and, challenging, right? Yeah. If you say you're a common carrier, then you are in fact regulating them. You're saying you can't make any decisions. Yes. If you say you are exercising editorial control, they are protected by the First Amendment. Yes. And then regulations get very, very difficult. Right. It feels like even with AI, when we talk about content generation with AI or with social networks, we run right into the First Amendment over and over again. And most of our approaches, this is what I worry about, is we try to get around it so we can make some speech regulations without saying we're gonna make some speech regulations. Copyright law is the most effective speech regulation on the internet because everyone will agree, okay, Disney owns that, bring it down. Well, because there's 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 property involved. Well, right? there's, there's, there's money involved. There's money. <laughs> well, maybe less property than money, but there's definitely money. Well, IP and, yeah. and, and hence money. Yeah. Well, uh, look, he, 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 here's my general view. Yeah. Um, but I, are, do you worry that we're, we're making fake speech regulations without actually talking about the balance of equities that you're describing I, I, here? I think that it, we need to have, and, and AI, I think, is going to force this, that we need to have a much more robust public conversation around these rules and agree to some broad principles to guide us. And the problem is right now, let's face it, it's gotten so caught up in partisanship, partly because of the last election, partly because of COVID and vax and anti-vax proponents, that we've lost sight of our ability to just come up with some principles that would don't advantage one party or another or one position or another, but do reflect our broad adherence to democracy. Um, but I, I, the, the point I guess I'm, I'm emphasizing here is this is not the first time we've had to do this. We had to do this when radio emerged. We had to do this when television emerged. And you know, it was easier to do back then, 
in part because you had three or five companies or you, you know, the the public through the government technically owned the airwaves. And so you could make these. No, no, this is the square on my bingo card. If I could get to the red lion case with you, I've I've won. Right. There is a there is a framework here that said the government owns yes. the airwaves. It's going to allocate them to people. Yes in some way yes. and we can make some decisions and that right. is an effective and appropriate that, that, regulation. that was the hook. Can you bring that to the internet? I, I, I think you have to find a different kind of hook. Sure. But ultimately, even though the idea that the public and the government own the airwaves, that, that, that was really just another way of saying this affects everybody. <laughs> and so we should all have a say in how this operates. And we, believe in capitalism and we don't mind you making a bunch of money through the innovation and the products that you're creating and the content that you're putting out there. But we want to have some say in what our kids are watching or how things are being advertised, et cetera. If you were the president now yeah. and I was with my family last night and the idea that the Chinese TikTok teaches kids to be scientists and doctors in our TikTok, the algorithm is different. <laughs> and we should have a regulation like China has that teaches our kids. To be it came up yeah. and all the parents around the table said, yeah, we're super into that. We, we should do that. How would you write a rule like that? Is it even possible with our First Amendment? Well, look, for a long time, let's say under television, there, there were requirements around children's television. It kept on getting watered down to the point where anything qualified as children's television, right? Um, we had a, a fairness doctrine that made sure that there was some balance in terms of how views were presented. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm not arguing, you know, good or bad in either of those things. I'm simply making the point that we've done it before. And there was no sense that somehow that was anti-democratic or it was that squashing innovation. It was just a understanding that we live in a democracy. And so we kind of set up rules so that, uh, we think the democracy works as better rather than worse. And everybody has some say in it. The idea behind the first amendment is we're going to have a marketplace of ideas that these ideas battle themselves at. And ultimately we can all judge better ideas versus worse ideas. Uh, and I deeply believe in that core principle. We are going to have to adapt to the fact that now there is so much content. There are so few regulators. Everybody's can throw up any idea out there, even if it's sexist, racist, violent, <laughs> et cetera. And that makes it a little bit harder than it did when we only had three TV stations or a handful of radio stations or what have you. But the principle still applies, which is how do we create a, a, a deliberative process where the average citizen can hear a bunch of different viewpoints and then say, you know what, here's, here's what I agree with, here's what I don't agree with, and hopefully through that process we get better outcomes. Let me, let me crash the two themes of our conversation yeah. together, AI and the social platforms. Meta just had earnings. Yeah. Mark Zuckerberg was on the earnings call, and he said, for our feed apps, Instagram, Facebook, threads, for the feed apps, I think that over time, more of the content that people consume is either going to be generated or edited by, by AI. Mm -hmm. So he envisions a world in which social networks are showing people perhaps exactly what they want to see Absolutely. inside of their preferences, right. much like advertising that keeps yep. them engaged. Should we regulate that away? Should we tell them to stop? Should we embrace this as a way to show people more content that they're willing to see that might expand their worldview? This is something I've been wrestling with for a while. I gave a speech about misinformation in our information silos at Stanford last year. I, it, I am concerned about business models that um, just feed people exactly what they already believe and agree with and uh, all designed to sell them stuff. Uh, do I think that's great for democracy? No. Do I think that um, that's something that the government itself can regulate? I'm skeptical that you can come up with perfect regulations there. What I 
actually think probably needs to happen, though, is that we need to think about different platforms and different um, models, different business models, so that it may be that I'm perfectly happy to have AI mediate how I buy jeans <laughs> online, right? That could be very efficient. I'm perfectly happy with it. If, if you know, and, and so if, if, if it's a shopping app or, or a thread, fine. When we're talking about political discourse, when we're talking about culture, et cetera, can we create other places for people to go that broaden their perspective, make them uh, curious about uh, how other people are, are seeing the world, uh, where they actually learn something as opposed to just reinforce their existing biases. But I, but I don't think that's something that government is going to be able to sort of um, uh, legislate. I think that's something that consumers uh, and interacting with companies are going to have to discover and, and find alternatives. The interesting thing, look, I'm, I'm not obviously 12 years old. I didn't grow up you know, with my thumbs on, on these screens. So I, I, I'm, I'm an old ass, you know, 62 year old guy. <laughs> they sometimes can't really work all the apps on my phone, but, um, I, I do have two daughters who are in their twenties and it's interesting the degree to which at a certain point they have found almost every, um, you know, app, social media app thread getting kind of boring after a while it gets old precisely because all it's doing is telling me what you you already know or what the the program thinks you want to know or what you want to see so you're not surprised anymore you're not discovering anything anymore you're not learning anymore and 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 so i think there's a there's a promise to how we can uh th there's a market let's put it that way i think there's a market for products that don't just do that. Mm -hmm. It's the same reason why, you know, people have asked me around AI, you know, are there going to still be artists around and singers and actors, or is it all going to be gener you know, computer generated stuff? And, and my answer is, you know, for elevator music, <laughs> AI is going to work fine. You know, for a bunch of elevator musicians just freaked out, dude. <laughs> you know, for 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 uh, uh, the average, um, you know, even legal brief, uh, or let's say a research memo <laughs> in a law firm, AI can probably do as good a, yeah. a job as a second year law associate. It was certainly as good a job as I did. <laughs> exactly, but you know, Bob Dylan. Or me, Stevie so Wonder. Answer, there's one thing. That, that, that is different. And the reason is because part of the human experience, part of the human genius is it's almost a mutation. It's not predictable. It's messy. It's new. It's different. It's rough. It's, it's weird. That is the stuff that ultimately taps into something deeper in us. And, and I think there is going to be a market for that. Um, so you, in addition to being the former president, you are a best-selling author. You have a production company with yep. your wife. You're in the IP business, yep. which is why you think it's property. It's good. I appreciate that. Um, the thing that will stop AI in its tracks in this moment is copyright lawsuits, right? You ask a generative AI model to spit out a Barack Obama speech, and it, it will do it to some level of passability. Yeah. Probably C plus. That's my yeah. estimation. It'd, C plus. It'd be one of my worst speeches, but it, <laughs> would, it, it might sound. You fire a canon of C plus content at any business model on the internet, yeah. you upend it. Yeah. But there are a lot of authors, musicians now, artists suing the companies yeah. saying this is not fair use to train on our data right. to just ingest all of it. Where do you stand on that? Do you think that as an author, do you think it's appropriate for them to ingest this much content? Set me aside for a second, because the, uh, um, you know, Michelle and I, we've already sold a lot of books and we're doing fine. <laughs> and so I'm not overly stressed about it personally. But I, I, what I do think um, President Biden's executive order speaks to, but there's a lot more work that has to be done on this. And copyright is just one element of this. 
Um, if AI turns out to be as pervasive and as powerful as its proponents expect, and I have to say the more I look into it, I think it is going to be that disruptive, we are going to have to think about um, not just intellectual property, we're going to have to think about jobs and the economy differently. And not all these problems are going to be solved inside of industry. So what do I mean by that? Um, I, I think with respect to copyright law, you will, you will see people with legitimate claims uh, financing lawsuits and litigation and through the courts and various other regulatory mechanisms, um, you know, people who are creating content, they're going to figure out ways to get paid and to protect uh, the, the, the stuff they create. And it may impede the development of large language models for a while, but uh, over the long term, I don't think uh, that'll just be a speed bump. The broader question is going to be um, what happens when 10% of existing jobs now definitively can be done better by uh, some large language model or other variant of, of, of AI. And uh, are we going to have to re-examine uh, how we educate our kids and what jobs are going to be available? And you know, the, the, the truth of the matter is that for during my presidency, there was, I think, a little bit of naivete um, where people would say, you know, the answer to uh, lifting people out of poverty and making sure they have high enough wages is we're going to retrain them and we're going to educate them and they should all become coders because that's the future. Well, if AI is coding better than all but the very best coders, if chat GPT can generate a, a research memo better than the third, fourth year associate, maybe not the partner, you know, who's got a particular expertise or judgment, you know, now what are you telling young people coming up? And I think we're going to have to start having conversations about um, how do we pay those jobs that can't be done by AI? How do we pay those better? You know, um, healthcare, nursing, you know, teaching, uh, child care, uh, art, th things that are really important to our lives, but maybe commercially, historically have not paid as well. Um, are we going to have to think about the, the length of the work week and how we share jobs? Are we going to have to think about the fact that more people um, choose to uh, operate like independent contractors, but where are they getting their health care from and where are they getting their uh, retirement from, right? Uh, those are the kinds of conversations that I think we're going to have to start having yeah. to deal with. And that's why I'm glad that the, the you know, President Biden's EO begins that conversation. I, again, I can't emphasize enough because I think you'll see some people saying, well, we still don't have tough regulations. Where's the teeth in this? We're not forcing these big companies to do X, Y, Z as, as quickly as we should. Um, that I think this administration understands, and I've, I've certainly emphasized in conversations with them, this is just the start. And, and we're, you know, this is gonna unfold over the next two, three, four, five years. Uh, and by the way, it's gonna be unfolding internationally. You know, there's going to be a conference uh, this week in uh, in in England um, uh, around international safety standards on AI. Um, yeah, the vice president, uh, President Harris, is going to be attending. Uh, I think that's a good thing because part of the challenge here is we're going to have to have some cross-border frameworks and regulations and standards and norms. You know, that's part of what makes this different and harder to manage than you know the advent of radio and television because the internet by definition is 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 a, a worldwide phenomenon yeah you said you were the first digital president 
I got to ask, have you used these tools? Have you had the aha moment where the computer's talking to you? Have you generated a picture of yourself? I have used some of these tools during the course of, you know, these conversations and, and this research. And, you know, it's Is fun. Bing flirted with you yet? It flirts with everybody, I hear. <laughs> Bing didn't flirt with me, but, you know, the way they're designed, and I've actually raised this with some of the, the designers, um, you know, in some cases they're designed to anthropomorphize, to, to make it feel like you are talking to a human, right? It's, it's like, you know, uh, can, can we pass the Turing test, right? That's a specific objective because it makes it seem more magical. And in some cases it improves function, but in some cases it just makes it cooler. And so there's a little pizzazz there and people yeah. are interested in it. I, I have to tell you that generally speaking though, I, the way I think about AI is, as a tool, not a buddy. And I think part of what we're gonna need to do as um, these models get more powerful, and this is where I do think government can help, is also just educating the public on what these models can do and what they can't do. Um, that, you know, the, these are um, really powerful extensions of yourself and, and tools and, and, but also reflections of yourself. And, and so don't, don't get confused and think that, uh, somehow what you're seeing in the mirror is, is, uh, you know, uh, some other consciousness. A lot of times this is just feeding back to you. You just what want being to flirt with you. <laughs> this is what I felt personally, very, very deeply. Yeah. All right. Last question. Yeah. I need to know this. It's very yes. important to me. What are the four apps in your iPhone doc? Four apps at the bottom. I've got Safari. Key. I've got my text. You know the the the, the green green yeah. box. You're you're a blue bubble. Do you give people any crap for being a, a green bubble? Uh, no, no, I'm 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 okay. All right. Um, I've got uh, my email, and I have my music. That's it. It's like the stock set. Yeah, good. yeah. I, you know. Uh, if you asked the, the the ones that I probably go to more than I should, I, I might have to put like words with friends on there uh, where I think I waste a lot of time. And maybe my uh, NBA league pass. Oh, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. <laughs> but, but, but uh, you know, I, 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 I try not to. <laughs> Overdo it on the League those. Pass is just one click above the dock. That's what <laughs> that's, I'm getting out of this. That's exactly. President Obama, thank you so much for being on Decoder. I really appreciate this conversation. I really enjoyed it. And uh, and I want to emphasize once again, because you've got you've got a, an audience that understands this stuff, cares about it, is involved in it and working at it. If you are interested in helping to shape all these amazing questions that are gonna be coming up, um, go to AI.gov and see if there are opportunities for you fresh out of school or you might be an experienced, uh, you know, tech coder who's, 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 you know, done fine, you know, bought the house, got everything set up and says, you know what, I want to uh, do something for, for uh, the common good. Sign up. You know, this is part of what we set up uh, during my presidency, uh, U.S. Digital Services. And it's remarkable how many really high level uh, folks decided that for six months, for a year, for two years, them devoting themselves to questions that are bigger than just, you know, um, what uh, the, the, the latest app, you know, or, or video game was, um, tur turned out to be really important to them and meaningful to them. And uh, attracting that kind of talent into this field with that perspective, uh, I think is going to be vital. Yeah, sounds like All it. Right? Great to talk to you. Thanks so much. You bet. Thank you very really much. Really enjoyed it. I appreciate that. Come on. Why, why don't we get a picture of it? Yeah. Let's see. All right. Three, two, one. One more. Got it. Fantastic. Really Thank enjoyed you. it. You did great. Ha! Perfect. Thank you. One thing real quick. Yes, of course.